short day. Shabbos, Shabbat, Shabbos candles, candle lighting today is really early. It's 4.08. So we'll share a few words and you'll prepare. You'll do your final preparations for Shabbat. And God should hope should be a Shabbat of peace, tranquility, and an end to all, an end to all suffering. Let's begin with Sadok as we always do. Okay. And a chapter of Tehillim. Let's get some more light. Chapter 120. This is, of course, our custom to begin each Friday, our gathering with the giving of tzedakah and a prayer. This is chapter 120 of Tehillim, and it's a prayer that Hashem heal every broken heart and all, all suffering, all illness, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and that we merit without delay the fulfillment of His promise, a world perfected, healed, and redeemed, and reunited with all our loved ones here in this world. So friends, I'm assuming that many of you, if not all of you, read the email that I sent that you received this morning. It went out six o'clock this morning, as is our custom. Every Friday around six o'clock, you get my little love note, right? Some, some read it later, but I sent it. I sent it then. I write it actually, of course, Thursday night and, and Hani, uh, our office secretary uh, has it sent Friday morning. So you read what I wrote, I'm assuming. Uh, David Michikovsky, Duvidal, Midji was just saying, what a week, I assume you're referring to what I, what I wrote about. Of course, on the, the MTC uh, experience this week, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, 21st draw, sellout, Baruch Hashem, with record achievements in terms of sellout and in terms of of sponsorship, patrons, uh, event sponsors, and so on, which is a big chunk of our, uh, our budget and a great help for us to continue our work and, God willing, expand it much, much further and broader. And I wrote to you about the tragedy that our community suffered this week. I say our community because I know everybody's in a state of shock in the sudden passing, the tragic uh, accident, the passing of Joanna, Saidi, Bas, Masod, and Bifka. So I said to you that uh, I'm just coming from a meeting. This was last night. It was a kind of a supper meeting with about 15 friends of Joanna's son, Louis. What was the purpose of the meeting? So let me give you some context and background. The question everybody always asks when tragedy strikes is why? We will ask the question, even though we're not getting an answer. But the question is valuable because the question expresses faith. We expect that good things happen to good people. We question why there, a tragedy happens. The question why is an expression of our faith in God. It is, God forbid, for the atheist, in other words, there's no why. There's no why. There's no question. There's no answer. Life is random and things happen. There's no purpose to life. There's no creator. There's no meaning to life. It's all a cosmic accident, and so there is no question why. Things happen. Statistically, things happen. 
there are mutations in genes, there are earthquakes, there are tsunamis, and there are accidents at, uh, at crossings. And it happens that cars and bikes collide. Why? Things happen, no reason. It's just a statistical probability. That's all that is. Although, mind you, this is not our discussion today, but probability doesn't explain how existence came into being in the first place. How did it all start? What was the beginning? Why was there a beginning? These are questions science doesn't even ask because they cannot be answered without faith. But once things are here, we observe the laws of nature. So thereafter, things happen. And if we ask why, which every human being does, everybody asks why. That's an expression of faith. Where does it come from? Why do people believe in God, whether they acknowledge it or not? Because they're asking the question why. That means they, they have a question. Why are you asking why? Why do you believe, in other words, whether you face it or not? The answer is because there is a God, and it is true. And that's why we're going to ask the question. To rephrase that, why do people believe in God? Because he exists. He's there. Whether we consciously know him or feel him or not. So the question why is, is a good question. But it shouldn't stop there. Because overall, we're not getting an answer, at least not a specific answer. Now, why do I say not a specific answer, my friends? Because in the Torah, there God is revealed to us much insight into his mysterious workings. And again, this isn't the, the forum for this kind of discussion. We've had, we've had uh, lectures and talks and lecture series on the subject. But I'm just going to say, because it, you know, it's such a fundamental principle in Judaism, and that is reincarnation. If the soul comes back many times to earth. What happens in a given lifetime the truth is, is always inexplicable unless one knows the whole story of the before and the after. So th that isn't a, an answer fully, but it does put things into context and changes the question completely. What happens in a lifetime is part of an ongoing story of the individual. And therefore, we can draw no conclusions about why things happen because we're not privy to the picture. So it changes the question. But the real question is what, not why. This is, this is the real, or not that the question why isn't a real question, but that I'm saying the meaningful question, the critical question is what, meaning, what do we do? How do we respond? That's the more important of the two questions. Because asking why is very nice. It's a protest. It's an expression of faith. It's an expectation of justice, which is an expression of faith. But if it ends there and we go back to our lives unchanged, that's an additional tragedy over the tragedy that we're asking why. If it hasn't changed us, if we aren't moved, if we aren't responding, if we aren't learning. You see, friends, because part of the why is, part of the answer to the why, part of the answer to the why is, because this person's life and that person's death needs to move us. It's part of that person's mission. And if we don't respond, we're rendering their mission, well, we are retarding their mission. That's a tragedy on top of a tragedy. So the question the Jews ask is, what do I do? What do I learn? What do I do? How do I further? How do I further this soul's impact in the world? We all come down to the world to contribute to making the world a home for God and for every human being. How am I moved to intensify my efforts in that direction. What do we do? 
Now this, by the way, not by the way, therapeutically, uh, the value of this, the value of doing something dedicated to a loved one, for the loved one, because of the loved one, I'm doing something on a psychological, emotional level, it offers balm, some degree of balm and comfort. It doesn't end here. We are continuing his, her mission. We're connecting to the soul. It's part of the Kaddish and the Tzedakah that we give. And there's so many things Jews do in response to tragedy and death. And it's all part of that soul's continued mission and our connection. And it's part of our responsibility to respond this way. So the, the morning of the, the last day of Shiva, which is Wednesday morning, So there were friends, classmates, friends that had gathered, that had come every day, every day to, to, to be in Shul because the services were held in MTC. So they were there morning and night, these boys. They were there morning and night and also at the house. And some of them were there Wednesday morning. Here's the amazing thing, friends. Again, often so tragically, the Shiva ends and that's the end of it. And now. That's a tragedy on top of a tragedy. The Shiva, a few words are said and people go back to their lives and the mourners are left with their pain, bereft of a loved one. That's the tragedy on top of the tragedy. God forbid. Chas v'sholem. So with the friends gathered around, I, I suggested, I said, let's get together. You guys tell me when. The son is in a school out of town, Lewis. Let's see what, how we can continue. You know, because I saw, I saw the, these souls, these pure souls, these kids, they want to do something. They want to. They don't want this to end here. They want to remain connected to their friend, to their friend's mother. They want to do something for their friend, for their mother. So let's get together and let's, let's, let's discuss. So the next night, this was last night. We had some pizza and some sushi. And, uh, and the meeting was led by my son, Rabbi Levy. I began the meeting and then he left it in his hands. I asked him this morning, so what happened? Every kid took home a card, a little prayer card. that They're going to start to use and pray every day. They took home a little stocker box that they're going to keep in their bedroom and give tzedakah every day. And they resolved that they were going to come to where Lewis is at school. It's out of town. It's within driving distance. Every so often, every number of weeks, and make a minion for him there. So they can say Kaddish. And many of them said, and even when I don't go, I'm going to put on my tefillin every morning for a moment and say the Shema. The tragedy, friends, is we fail our children. They are precious souls who want to do, want to connect. And they don't know how. And we're not giving them the opportunity. I just had to make the suggestion. They were sure, Rabbi, we'll come. And within five minutes on a WhatsApp group was created and 15 responses, yeah, I'm coming. And they all came. And this is a matter of minutes. Of course, sure. What can we do? And they're taking upon themselves, you know, this is a uh, commitments, commitments. 
This is our generation. This morning, I think Alice, are you on? I didn't see you. My friend Alice. Let's see. What just happened here? No, so we have to see shine. Anyway, I think Alice, you, you're always on. You tell me you're coming on. I'm sure you're here. So I'm going to share, you know, in our, the class this morning. So Mark was saying, you know, we're talking about Sadaka. Sadaka, and I was sharing the the Jewish perspective on on Sadaka. It's not charity. Tzedakah does not mean charity. Charity means this is my dollar and I'm a nice person or I'm acting nicely and I'm giving it, I'm helping somebody else. That's not tzedakah. Tzedakah means the right thing. That's what it means. It's an act of righteousness or correctness. I'm doing the right thing, not the charitable thing. We're all trustees. We're all trustees, friends. We have no entitlement to anything. Life is a gift. Everything we have is a gift. It's entrusted to us by God and we're his partner. He wants us to use the gifts that he grants us to help somebody else, to part with him in perfecting, fixing his world and bringing redemption and healing. That's tzedakah. So Mark was saying, you know, it's it's so sad that for the most part, it's not translating to the next generation. In some cases, yes, but often not. What's obvious to me, and so we said, because the kids just aren't given the opportunity, they're not inspired, they're not told, they're not given. So here's something very practical, friends, that I, that I mentioned this morning, the class I'm sharing with you now. One of our ever's many campaigns that changed jury in the world is the following that every child from the earliest age should have their own sadaka box with a name on it decorated that they could decorate or even make themselves every day the child gives sadaka and then gives it to the charity of his or her choice do you, you know how powerful this is this means i can tell you for my own children and grandchildren money from the earliest age, I'm talking one year old younger, they put that coin in their hand and together before Shabbos or every day in that stocker box. Money means give it to somebody else. That's what it means first and foremost. Training from the earliest age to give. That's what it means. The coin before they even understand what a coin is. It's you put it in the stocker box and they get older and understand what that means. So that's my suggestion to you, friends. If you have children, grandchildren, you can go online. There's these beautiful children, decorative tzedakah boxes. What a gift. Each one with their name on it. Proudly in their room when it's full, again, to, the, to their school or the hospital or whatever, whatever the child wants. Physically to a poor person, or whatever, whatever the, the child wants to do. What an incredible education. What that is doing is, friends, it's just tapping into the soul of the child. The soul is seeks and wants to do what's right and connect to God. The soul is selfless. We need to allow expression. We're living in a very corrupted world, confused world, fragmented world. It's beyond the me generation. I don't know what word to describe it. But that's all peripheral. It's all surface. The soul is there. You just got to break through this nonsense with some light. It's just darkness, which has no real substance. And how do you drive away darkness? Not with a broom, goes the old Yiddish expression. You just turn the light on. Torah is light. Light. Wow, beautiful. And the kids respond, sure, sure.
we all have this responsibility to inspire, to touch, to be an example, not to preach, to be an example. To give opportunity for others to do good and express their souls. Everybody's good deep down, sometimes very deep, sometimes not so very deep, sometimes manifestedly. But we all have this divine soul. Torah mitzvahs, liberator, express the soul within us. So friends, it's tumultuous times on many levels, not just these tragedies. I mean, there's always been tragedies. But the world is in a state of agitation. Running out of time and that What's happening today, I'm talking the last few months and weeks. I believe there's an awakening. There's an awakening. We can hear the footsteps of Mashiach already. The world is searching. The idols are crumbling the old idols, the false idols that would bring salvation to the world, the crumbling, exposed for their corruption and emptiness. Keep your eyes open, you can see right through it. There's a desperate last hurrah, but it's not gonna last. It has no substance. So it's crumbling at our feet. And in its place, in its place, emerges the truth, holiness, sanctity, Hashem himself. So my dear friends, I bid you an inspiring, deep Shabbos. By deep, I mean inwardly. You know, the word Shabbat has the same Hebrew letters as the word Tashuv, which means to return inwards. Shabbos is a day to go inwards, to connect to each other inwardly, community, family, ourselves, our God. And therefore, it's time of rejuvenation. Because if you connect to the deep inner self, from there we draw endless inspiration and koyach, and soul is forever young and pure, life giving waters. That's what Shabbat is to drink deeply, to imbibe of the life-giving waters of our own soul, which is a spark of Hashem. So Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos, everybody. Good, Good Shabbos, Rabbi. Yep, let's meet again real soon with happy hearts and good news. And, and Good Shabbos, Rabbi. That's right. Good Shabbos. Trying to make Shia. sense with everything. Thank you. Reunited with all our loved ones, nothing less, friends. Amen. It's not enough Amen. that now one. It's not enough that now one is going to be good. The, the past has to be transformed. That's the messianic era. Transform. Shabbos, Rabbi. The pain of the past, the Shabbos, and the suffering. Shabbos, Peggy. Making it joyful. All right, friends. Uh, uh,